So it's wonderful, for example, to see, for example, you could, might be able to see a brand new Marilyn Monroe film, mm. romantic comedy in the, the 2020s, but using the likeness and, uh, of Marilyn Monroe. Question is whether audiences will buy into it. Welcome to AI Revolution, the podcast designed for entrepreneurs who are eager to harness the power of artificial intelligence to drive their business forward. We are here to bring you the latest insights, trends, and breakthroughs in the AI industry all tailored to help you to optimize your business strategy and stay ahead of the competition. Whether you are a tech savvy entrepreneur, an ambitious business owner looking to leverage AI, or simply fascinated by the potential of artificial intelligence, this podcast is your go-to resource. We discuss the top AI software and tools that can streamline your operations, delve into the possibilities and limitations of AI, and explore the emerging trends that will shape the business landscape. Join us on this exciting journey as we encounter our AI's transforming the world of entrepreneurship and revolutionize the way businesses operate. Tune into AI Revolution and take your business to new heights with the power of artificial intelligence. Hi, I'm delighted today that we have Professor John Cook here from Glasgow Caledonia University. He's a media, in, he's a media professor in film and television. And he's here to talk about it, how artificial intelligence is going to impact the area of film and media. And in his career, he's done a lot of research on Dennis Potter and Peter Watkins. And he's also taken part in a course on screenwriting. And, but he has an extensive media experience. So to start, make a start, how do you believe that the media can be impacted by artificial intelligence? Well, it's a big, big question because there's so much of this that's hit us so quickly, really since the, the turn of the year, this whole thing is starting to explode and we're getting more and more details coming out every day about changes that could happen. It's, I suppose for me, the question is, is this a continuation of a change that we could really call the digital revolution that we could trace back for about 25 years, just in the mid 1990s with the, the advent of the internet. So is it, is this just a, a, the next evolutionary step or is this actually a revolution in which everything is going to change? If you believe the media hype, it is going to be a revolution. Everything will change and, and the world will never be the same again. And we're all going to be destroyed by killer robots, but. To what extent these are just simply tools that are the mixed development from the internet. The internet, in a sense, is a form of collective intelligence. It allows people to, to access information in a way that's been unprecedented in human history. The, you mean, the internet is the biggest revolution in dissemination of knowledge since the, the invention of the printing press in the 1400s. AI scours the internet, the chat GPT, etc. scours the internet and repackages it and, and simulates it in some sense. But the question is, as this, these neural networks get more and more sophisticated, are they going to sweep everything away? And that includes in my field of, of media, where, you know, we can go through, I guess, in more detail now of the different ways in which this could, could really impact different media sectors. Two more. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, definitely agree. It's it's very revolutionary, and we're happy, very happy to have you here, here, Professor Professor Cook. And can you discuss some of the recent achievement AI that are particularly exciting or groundbreaking for the film or TV industry in particular? Yeah, well, the 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 way in which AI uh, could, for example, you know. Why do you need a scriptwriter to, or a team of scriptwriters to write a superhero movie where essentially it's generic, where, where the, the, you know, you know that there's going to be a big bad, there's going to be a big villain, there's, there's going to be the superheroes who are maybe all fighting individually and then unite together and uh, defeat the villain and so on. So we all know the, the formula in that kind of area. And these, the, the, that's, these are the films that, that sell as well, that, that make the big bucks, you know, as opposed to sort of small niche art cinema, more individuals type films. So AI would seem to me to be very good and very adept at repackaging elements of previous superhero narratives, you know, 
enter into chat GPT, write, write me a film screenplay in the style of a, in, in, in mm. the genre of a superhero movie, and it'll spit it out. So that kind of area, it seems to me, is one of the ways in which AI tools will vastly impact the screenwriting industry. Not so sure about the, the, the smaller art house films. And in some ways, it may be that it's a bit like the, the change from vinyl to digital with CDs and then eventually streaming. Uh, then you had the movement back to authenticity and to, you know, people wanting to buy vinyl again, mm. get that authentic mm. feel, you know, that's pre-digital. And what you might start to see is, is the same sort of thing where creativity actually paradoxically, human creativity paradoxically comes to be more valued rather than less valued because of the fact that AI tools are so, so ubiquitous and widespread. So what might actually happen is that the art cinema that's individual and personal and idiosyncratic and can't be created by computers will actually come to be more valued. So, so paradoxically, commercial cinema might end up being devalued and art cinema might actually have a triumphant return because it's seen as distinctively human and that you can't get an, an AI bot to, to make a movie in necessarily in the style of Ingmar Bergman. I mean, you can try, but it probably won't be terribly yeah. good. Whereas you, you probably can get AIs to, to write a screenplay based on the Avengers, previous Avengers movies, repackage the elements and it'll probably be okay. Yeah. But that, that must be a bit of a worry then for screenwriters, et cetera, that if they might be out of job, do, do you see them using more of a tool or? A... I was thinking about the same. Yeah. What is your take on this, Professor? Well, the, the, there's currently a, a big writer's guild strike in America, in, in Hollywood at the moment, and they're protesting about a number of different things. But one of the things they're afraid of is, is the rise of AI and the fact that, that com, you know, very commercial script writers could find themselves out of a job. Also, you think about television as well. Shows like CSI that have been running for decades now, one of the biggest television shows in the world. You know, these these multi-episode shows that are fairly bread and butter, that are not doing anything too distinctive, could easily be written by, by AIs. And um, so therefore, you know, producers could just bypass the writers, you know, so the writers, it's a bit like, the industrial revolution when the horses were replaced by cars. So the blacksmiths were out of work. So, because, you know, it can be done, automation can, can be done. So that, that might affect the commercial side. But again, I come back to that point that some elements of the screenwriting industry may benefit because they will, they will, you know, individual human creativity will be much more valued. So, so again, you may see a similar trend, to, um, predicting with the movie industry, where the television industry, a niche kind of, I don't know, you know, small streaming show that reaches a niche audience might become more and more privileged in this new era that we're coming into. You know, it's, it's the old thing, nobody knows anything, you know, I'm just speculating, you know, it would just at such an early stage yet that, that it could go any which way. But certainly there are fears right now in Hollywood amongst creative people, mm. like screenwriters, that they might be out of a job. So. That's a good one. And, but for regular people, I would go to say that a regular person watching a movie is not so much concerned about if a screenwriter writer would be replaced. Very obvious threat for the screenwriters and, and really true indeed. And they're very valuable people. But I think for most people think, okay, my favorite actor, will my favorite actor actually be replaced? So what is your take on this topic? Will uh, the actors also be replaced? And if, when? Well, that, that's a big fear amongst established Hollywood actors. So for example, after they die, will their image be used in ways that they would not want their image to be used? Now we're already sort of seeing elements of this. I mean, I, I, I've certainly noticed in the UK there seems to be lots of adverts using the image of Albert Einstein. So it's basically actors who are, they've used CGI digital tools to create a likeness of Albert Einstein. So, uh, so the Albert Einstein's estate has, has licensed the likeness of Einstein to be used in adverts. And that's been a pattern probably for at least the last 20 years that it's possible to, to do legal deals so that your likeness can be used after your day. But the problem is, when you move into the world of deep fakes, where, you know, any 
teenager in their bedroom could, could deep fake, you know, Donald Trump declaring nuclear war on Russia. Uh, actors then start to, to get very worried about how their image can be used. And so I know that there's, again, similar to what's happening with the writers in Hollywood, there's a lot of concern among, amongst actors. Whether actors will actually be physically replaced by, by the avatars. I mean, I think in, in one sense, what's great about AI tools is it can bring back the dead, provided they, they, they can do mm. the right state of the estate. So it's wonderful, for example, to see, for example, you might be able to see a brand new Marilyn Monroe film, mm. romantic comedy in the, the 2020s, but using the likeness and, of Marilyn Monroe. Question is whether audiences will buy into it. I mean, there's been is, some issues in the, the recent history of Hollywood where, for example, a lot of people felt that the digital recreation of the actor Peter Cushing in the Star Wars films, I think it was Star Wars Road mm-hmm. 1 that he appeared at the very end of, the, of that movie, and it seemed fake. It didn't, it didn't seem real. I think also Carrie Fisher appeared as well as Princess Leia, and it, audiences didn't buy into it. Partly in the new Indiana Jones film, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, which is, is just on the cusp of being released, they de-aged Harrison Ford for the first half hour of the, the film. So you see a young Harrison Ford as people remember of the 80s. And apparently that digital likeness is quite, quite good. But at the moment, I, think, I don't think we're quite there in terms of audience believability. Audiences have a good sense of what is a real human face and what is, what is fake. Even, even ABBA Voyage, which is, 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 work, is in London at the moment, performing to great acclaim, if you, if you look at the famous abatage that they've created, it's actually distance in, on stage and the lighting effects that create the 3D effect that they're real. If you actually see close-ups of the, of the cars, you can tell, no, that's not Bjorn, mm. that's not Ben, he's a, he's a fake. So I don't think we're quite there yet, but definitely actors are worried that they might, might get replaced. Yeah, exactly. I, I agree. We are not there yet, but if we look at the development from the 90s when, okay, let's 70s, they made Star Wars and they, they had these tiny objects. They, they, they actually moved the, the tiny model of the, the spaceship. And now they make them with computers. And I was playing computer games in the 90s. We had some of the earliest computers with, with, from my dad. And, you know, like you play this small guy, tick, tick, tick. And now it seems like almost realistic. So are we inevitably in a process of going to that place where we cannot extinguish the actor from, from AI or a robot. Well, that's certainly the drive and that's certainly the, the, where the, where the money is being put into. And, and also, you know, in terms of developments in robotics as well, so that eventually your AI will not just be a chat GPT that, 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 that you prompt on, a, on your, your laptop, but actually, you know, a functioning, functioning robot. We're still some way away. I think the, the human eye is extremely adept at, at telling what is fake and what is, what is not fake. So the drive will be for, for ever more accurate simulations, but the audience at the same time it, it is not that easily fooled. So I think we're still some way away, but certainly that's the direction of Trump. And another area that might be taken over by AR is reviewing, and film reviewing or right even, I mean, the the reviews as well could be written by ChatGTP or the screen. The reviewer could write them by ChatGTP, but it could also be that the AI goes in on review films and review various aspects of TV, etc. What would you? Or how do you see this threat coming in? And for example, for TV critics or yeah, so so I mean, we're already seeing the education. The the the. the... Educationists are deeply worried that, you know, a student, whether it be a school pupil or, or a student at university, can just spit out an AC that would get reasonably good marks. So the question is, can you do the same with a, with a review? Of course, the problem with reviewing is that the reviewer actually has to have some knowledge and has to have actually seen the film that you want to review or the TV program. And chat GPT, all it can really do is scour the internet and repackage. So in that sense, it can, it can plagiarize review, existing reviews that are, that are there on the web and repackage them together. And in a way that might simulate a genuine re- re- reviewer response. But remember the AI at the moment, at least as configured at the moment, is, is a simulation device. So it can fool you. 
but it's not actually the same as a critic have physically watched that movie and then given their own heartfelt response with all the quips and, and insights that critic can bring. So again, if I was a, a you know, I'm not a critic, I'm a critic in one sense, but I work for an institution and write academic works, but I'm not a, a reviewer, but I think reviewers can still make the case that they, that they, it's not easy to replace them. You know, people want, read, people read up a, pick up a newspaper review or look at it online. They're wanting the voice of that critic, you know, who's, who they, whose style they recognize. And uh, well, that's, uh, it's very easy now for, for chat GPT to, to simulate styles. Again, it doesn't have that element of creativity and advancement that a human has. And it's like, it's like a different question. So you have studied Peter Wofkins and Dennis Potter. What do you think they would think about this AI prediction? Do you think they would have used AI or would, would they have written about it? Well, does your audience know you? These two are, yeah. So Dennis Potter, he was the famous screenwriter, wrote The Singing Detective and is widely seen as one of the, the greatest creative writers in TV drama. Peter Watkins, who's still alive, is a, 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 a filmmaker who specialised in documentary dramas, trying to create with ultra-realism historical events, but using amateur actors. I suppose both play their part in this. I mean, Dennis Potter was fascinated by the... the the blurring between reality and fantasy. And his final drama, which he, he wrote to just as he was dying from cancer in 1994, it was produced in 1996, is called Cold Lazarus. And it's about a dead writer whose, whose brain cells are reactivated 300 years later and uh, his memories are beamed to the world's population through virtual reality headsets. So Potter would be fascinated yeah. by the latest books in virtual reality and particularly the way in which a simulation could be regarded as, as, as real. So he would be fascinated by it and also warning against it because his final drama called Lazarus was, was a warning about this new world of virtual reality that he saw back then in uh, the 90s. Really? And yeah. So it was, you know, it was in the tradition of George Orwell kind of warning of the dangers and that in the end, you know, you, you have to embrace reality rather than, than simulation. Hmm. Peter Watkins is 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 about the blurring of of the lines between drama and documentary, and again, that's similar. In his case, I think he's if you look at his website and he's still active, he's still writing, always at an advanced age now. He's very much warns against the the omnipresence of the media distorting everything in our world, and he's he's a very harsh critic of of the mass media and and what he calls the monoform, the idea that, that everything's becoming homogenized and uh, ultra-commercial. So he, he would probably be despairing of this is the next step in the commercialization of all our lives. Mm. Yeah. I have. Uh, do you have, Charlotte, something to add to that? Uh, no, but I, I was just going back to what we discussed last uh, time about ethics. And I'm just wondering, do you think then that maybe there needs more legislation? I mean, I'm just thinking the ethical concern in terms of what, what's happening to the media industry. Do you think that legislators should go in and say, yeah, we need to control it in terms of the media or like, do, do we need, do, do, does it need specific legislation? to protect yeah. that as job or that kind of thing. That's a good question. I would like to add that because you mentioned about George Orwell and, and all these dangers. So good questions, Alot. Yeah. So, well, this is, this is what's happening at the moment is that the, the, the parliaments and governments around the world are just waking up to this. Right now, it's the Wild West in terms of AI. You know, in most Western countries, it's, there's, there's sadly, it, there's no regulation. We're not, it's not there yet. There's committees investigating it, but, you know, it's completely unregulated. And of course, the fear is that um, with any, any tool like this is it can be bad actors. It might include state actors. In other words, governments hostile to the West could start to use these tools for, for ill to harm people in the West. So, so everybody's looking at how, how they regulate this. It's interesting, I'm sort of reading the, a lot of the AI gurus, the people that have developed these networks, they are very much calling for regulation. They are saying that the way to, to regard these new tools is not to regard them as some sort of apocalyptic threat that's going to wipe out everything, but instead, just, just with any new development, you need a process of regulation, just as 
in, increasingly there was concern 10 years ago to regulate social media with some successes but also a lot of failures in the same way you've got to to kind of put regulatory frameworks in place for ai so i think the eu and united states level there'll be this kind of regulation in my own country the uk when we, we've got the we're out of the Europe now, so we can't be part of some sort of European-wide directive on this. So the UK Parliament, I think, is looking at this. And there's, I think there's just in the last week, there's been a report by a special panel looking at AI who've reported to the UK Parliament Committee that's going to look at this. So, so regulation is definitely the future for AI. I would definitely agree with that. And but there is like challenges, in my opinion, because maybe we are able to regulate it. But how are we ever going to able to regulate countries like China and Russia to get them with the game? This is not topic of movies, of course, but in general about the topic. Well, it wouldn't be. I mean, all you could, all you suppose you can hope for is that each respective, if we're still in this world of sort of giant blocks, you know, we, we thought we had moved away from this, you know, at the end of the Cold War, you know, you had the Soviet bloc and the, the Western bloc, but in a way we're, we're now in this world of Russia, China on one side and Europe and US on the other. But you hope that the, each of those blocks will will want to protect themselves around threats from the other side, mm. uh, from AI. And so in that sense, you know, each of these areas will, will introduce some kind of regulations. It's problem is that whether AI can then is then bound up, as I suspect, inevitably it will, in military, the, each of the militaries will start to incorporate AI in ways that are not, is not necessarily good for the, the future of the world. So with anything, you know, you know, we have to remember, ultimately, AI is just an extension of human beings. So just, just like the, the, in the internet, you see all human life there for good or for bad, it will be the same with AI. And then it's just a case of, well, how do we manage this? And how do we manage it in such a way that we minimize threat, both at the individual and national levels, but also at a global level, you know, that, that manage threats to the world that inevitably arise with any new technology. And do you have any follow-on question about that? Or otherwise, I... No, I would just like to thank that. Uh, that's a good reply and, uh, and a timely topic. Uh, and yeah. for me, I would like to add, it's fascinating that this AI is developing, but sometimes we forget at the same time the virtual reality you mentioned about. All these things are developing at the same time and we have completely forgotten about nanotechnologies or like wild things like our brains could be integrated in a, in a, like a robot and, and then our consciousness living forever in some computer, which is like really wild <laughs> things some people are talking about. Goes a little bit over my head, to be honest. The final question I have, though, is bringing back to the topic of AI and film and television. So how do you think AI influenced the teaching at the study of film and television in academic universities like South Caledonia and other places? Well, the educationalists are just scrabbling at the moment to try and uh, grasp this. I mean, on one hand, you've got kind of, I'm not talking about my own university, I'm talking about generally move certain institutions trying to ban the whole thing so to stop students using chat gpt for essays and so on but probably as this thing settles and starts to and people start to get their heads around it in educational terms it'll be used as a tool and so you know, wonderful for example i mean often in the teaching of media a big problem is that you know access to the centers of power in media are difficult you know so students and an institution, say, like my own in Scotland, haven't got direct access to the BBC in London and so on. But you can imagine how AI tools and, and virtual reality that's been mentioned can be harmonized so that, so that you, you can, for example, get access to some of the best production facilities virtually. And you can also use AI for crewing and, and using digital avatars to make your own films, for example don't necessarily need to involve your friends as student actors, for example. You can maybe, maybe there'd be equivalent of some kind of creative commons, for example, where, a, you know, a number of actors agree to that their likenesses can be used for student films and, and so on. So you can, so the possibilities are there. We're just really just at very, very early stages of trying to conceptualize how, how AI can be used. 
But just as the as universities universities led the way on the development of the internet, it was universities that pioneered the, the idea of co linking computers that eventually then led to the internet that we know today in the 90s, developing much more commercially to the general public. So in a similar way, universities will lead the way in, in terms of AI, because of course, a lot of the, the work that's going on around AI is taking place in, in universities, computing departments. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, is there anything else you want to add? No, I think we've probably co covered it. I would say that uh, people in day shouldn't be too frightened. I mean, they, there's a long history of what a writer called Stanley Cohen talked about 50 years ago, moral panics. He wrote a book on moral panics, which is the idea that any new phenomenon, often phenomenon that are associated with young people, tends to create a panic where you suddenly get big newspaper headlines. So in the 50s, it was rock and roll. In the 60s, it was hippies. In the 70s, it was punks. And also you've had moral panics or video games and the advent of video game technology that was all going to sort of destroy society. So the AI is the latest in the long line of moral panics. And with any new technology, there are dangers and we have to be mindful of that and we have to regulate. But at the same time, you know, be optimistic. Let people use these tools and the majority of them hopefully will we'll use them for good rather than bad. I also have one. Okay, go ahead, Salat. You had something to add. No, 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 that's right. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I had one question. If there was one actor who is not among us present anymore, but you could wake them from that to the to the to the screen again, who would it be? Oh, there's a question. There's so many. The thing is that so many famous actors that are dead. I mean, I mentioned Marilyn Monroe. She would obviously be commercially the the bear. You can imagine all you know the big commercial value in heart, but I suppose actors who are greatly missed, maybe people like Richard Burton, perhaps, the famous, famous Welsh actor, Laurence Olivier, even, both on stage and on screen, because he acted on screen. So that list is endless. I mean, the the roll call of, of dead famous actors is, is a long one, but probably the commercial money is on people like Marilyn Monroe, Humphrey Bogart, maybe. But again, it's all about whether whether the states are happy to to allow that. It would definitely be interesting to see. Yeah, indeed, indeed, repackaged. Yeah. Thanks. Like, subscribe, and follow. And most importantly, share this episode with someone who might benefit from it. And let's carry on the conversation in the comments and in our website aipodcast.online. Your feedback and insights mean a lot to us. Thanks for tuning in and see you again in the next episode.